Greetings and welcome to Walden's Pond on this August 8th, 2004. I'm Shelton Walden, your host and producer of Walden's Pond, the weekly radio program that comes your way every Sunday, 1 to 2 p.m. here on WBAI 99.5 FM. We discuss health, environment, politics, and so much more. 30 years ago today marked the resignation of President Richard M. Nixon from the White House. We'll be talking with a very special guest, someone who was very intimately involved with the White House, John W. Dean, counsel to the president, the man who blew the whistle on Watergate, one of the main figures in the Watergate scandal. We'll be talking about what's happening today in 2004 regarding the presidency and the war in Iraq and so many other things. He's written a book called Worse Than Watergate. That and so much more on this edition of Walden's Pond. Please stay tuned. <music> Back with you here live on WBAI. It's four after the hour of one o'clock on this August 8th, 2004. And I'm very privileged to have John W. Dean here on Walden's Pond this afternoon. Mr. Dean. Hi, Shelton. Hi, how are you this afternoon? I'm terrific, and you? Uh, very good. It's a privilege to have you here with us to talk about these uh, events, uh, uh, both uh, past and uh, present, and maybe in the future. Nice to come to the pond. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, on this day, August 8th, 1974, a very historic day in American history, President Richard Nixon, the 37th President of the United States, resigned from office, the first president in U.S. history to do so. And uh, it ended a uh, chapter in American history which will never be forgotten. You were one of the centerpieces of that scandal. Uh, Mr. Dean, I remember watching you uh, when I was in short pants, uh, uh, testifying uh, in front of the, the uh, hearings uh, shared by Senator Sam Irving and a uh, very uh, powerful testimony. I remember remembering. I remember thinking at the time I was uh, worried about your own safety. Uh, well, I, the government was too at that time. I actually was in the witness protection program. The, what, the government was very concerned about keeping me alive in those days, so I was in the witness protection program for about a year. Uh, uh, I, I didn't. I wasn't particularly fond of it. My wife liked it because there were always two marshals at the house to help her with the groceries when she came home. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you were. You you certainly will go down in history, and there's no question about that. As um, someone who um, helped blow the whistle on uh, Watergate and uh, try to bring some decency to government. Well, uh, it's never it's never pleasant to have to do that, but you got to do what you have to do sometimes. Uh, it wasn't a situation, you know, anybody I had any respect for in that uh, administration, I told them exactly what I was going to do before I did it. Uh, and I don't think they thought I would do it, but I did. <laughs> yes, you did. You certainly did. Just just, just to go back a bit, what, what were your thoughts on this day 30 years ago? Well, actually, uh, it's, it's very curious. The night he gave, delivered his uh, uh, resignation speech that day, it was a weekday, uh, 30 years ago, and I had had uh, four wisdom teeth pulled, and I was like a chipmunk sitting in front of the television <laughs> watching it. So I, I remember both the event, and I remember both my condition. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Did you, did you feel a sense of uh, satisfaction? I don't think anybody could take satisfaction with, with the fact that Nixon had to be uh, forced out of office. Uh, it was a very unpleasant situation for everybody. Uh, it, it was a night, it was, a, you know, clearly it was not, for me, the culmination of Watergate. What people forget, and the story of Watergate typically ends with Nixon getting on his airplane uh, the next morning and after delivering a rather heart-wrenching uh, and emotional, probably as, as frank a talk as he'd ever given during his presidency uh, before he left the White House and then going out and uh, doing his famous wave and, and signs the V and getting on the helicopter and flying off. That's where the story ends for a lot of people. Actually, it doesn't end there, because what came next was the, the cover-up trial of his principal aides and, and uh, the really most powerful people in Washington, uh, former Attorney General John Mitchell, uh, former Chief of Staff Bob Haldeman, and former uh, top domestic advisor John Ehrlichman, who would go to trial uh, that fall, and uh, it's interesting, history has totally ignored that event, and there's some talk right now, and I'm trying to help put together a, a 
panel that is going to revisit that trial because that's actually the last event of Watergate where those men were found guilty. And uh, uh, as I say, the, mm. it really the system. Uh, there you were in D.C. with uh, jurors from across the uh, width and breadth of the District of Columbia uh, having their final say on some of those powerful men in government. Absolutely. Um, did did you were you um, I, I, memory uh, is fading now? Did you have to do any um, uh, time for your role in Watergate? I what happened is I was originally sentenced by Sirica. Uh, to a pretty hefty sentence. Judge, right? Judge John Sirica. Judge, Judge John Sirica, mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. And uh, what ha- what happened, I never did go to jail, though, because mm-hmm. I was in the wet- witness protection program. They actually, uh, for 120 days, I had to stay in the exclusive custody of the marshals in the safe mm-hmm. house outside of, uh, in Maryland, at, a, at a, an army base. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was in there with a bunch of uh, mafia figures who were also in the witness protection program, <laughs> And I actually wasn't allowed to talk to anybody, uh, uh, even there. They actually had a marshal outside my room. It was a B. It was it was, a, it was one of these old for, former uh, barracks that they used for officers during the uh, during World War II. They built these all over the country, and they used that as a safe house. And I said I was dr- driven every day from uh, Fort Holabird into the District of Columbia, mm. and then spent the days in the uh, in the uh, uh, Watergate prosecutor's office. Wow. So it was an unusual situation. It certainly was. Well, sir, uh, back in April, you published a book called Worse Than Watergate, the secret presidency of George W. Bush by someone like yourself who was intimately involved in in the presidency. Um, uh, I, you know, I coming from you, it's powerful stuff because you were right there in the center of everything during that time. Well, Uh, it's not a title I would use lightly. I assure you that. I, I can imagine. It, it, just, uh, just give us a little sketch of why you wrote this book at, at this particular time. What caused you to write this book? Well, first of all, I promised myself when I turned sixty I would return to writing full time, and I didn't quite make it at sixty, but I did by the time I was sixty-two, and I've been cranking them out ever since. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I was writing a bi-weekly column for an online site called Fine Law, and occasionally I would write articles. I was finishing up my Harding biography, uh, and when Bush came into office, and I would, I noticed pretty quickly that it was I, that it seemed to me that they were going down a path that was only too familiar to me, and I wasn't sure they knew what the hell they were doing. So I'd throw up an occasional flare, and I quickly realized they knew exactly what they were doing, and they'd chosen this path of concealment. It's like they went down in the uh, sub basement of the White House, found an old Nixon playbook, and dusted it off and brought it up and said, this stuff looks pretty good. Wow. Uh, and yet we'd written a book on what not to do, but they seemed to like it. And that's, as I kept monitoring the situation, I noticed that the mainstream media was ignoring the obsessive secrecy of this presidency, how they moved in, pulled the shades, closed the doors, and put a gag order on the White House and it, as much of the government as they could. And this is pre-9-11. Yes. Uh, so this is what got my attention, and this is where the process started. And, and, and where did they go from there? Because, uh, you, you, you know, Nixon was extremely uh, paranoid. Uh, we, we, his, his thirst for secrecy was, was overwhelming. And, and but, but you say this is even, in this administration, the second Bush administration here, uh, it's even worse. It is worse. Uh, what, and I, I think I'm pretty familiar with most presidencies. While I was in one presidency, I've been a longtime student of the presidency. I actually did my graduate work uh, before law school on the, the American presidency. I have a library that fills several walls about books of all the uh, all 43 uh, presidents, if you will. And uh, so I, it's, it's a subject I'm pretty familiar with. And as I look at this presidency, I've never seen anything quite like it. Actually, when Nixon went into office and when I went to the White House in July of 1970, I wasn't there at, right in January of 69 when they went in. I, went, I was at the Department of Justice still as an associate deputy attorney general. Mm-hmm. And I went over to the White House in July of 70. It was a pretty open place. Uh, his policy uh, really was to, to try to, to uh, respond to congressional requests to... Uh, not uh, shut down the operations with the press and the media. He's the one who built the uh, the newsroom for the for the press over the old White House pool and gave them some decent quarters instead of having them uh, 
spread out all over the West Wing lobby uh, as they were. Uh, and there was pretty good communication with the press. He was held frequent press conferences. It's really when the leaks started, the major leaks, and particularly when the so-called Pentagon Papers, which were the, which was the uh, voluminous, classified, highly classified study of the origins of the war in Vietnam, uh, which leaked in mid June of 1971. That's when Nixon really starts uh, becoming much more secretive, and the clamp comes down, and the whole atmosphere in the Nixon White House changes. Uh, and that's where we saw it only went from there and got worse. And obviously, when Watergate came on the scene, he he clamps down everything. And we see we see really though after the the, the leak how uh, the secrecy spawned the scandals that would later erupt into Watergate. So in looking at the Bush administration and noticing that this they had clamped down from day one as a matter of policy. In fact, I when writing the book, I actually went back and looked at the campaign and realized that George Bush had taken off the table, uh, you know, things that have long been on the table for almost every presidential election, issues of his character. Uh, he said, the first 40 years of my life, I'm not even going to answer questions about them. Well, I think all of us like to, d- <laughs> to dispose of maybe a 40-year hunk of our life and sure. then go on. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, and, and what was interesting is the press never pressed him on these things. Same with Cheney. Cheney, who, when he left... Uh, public service and went into uh, to, to uh, private industry at Halliburton to become the CEO and chairman of the board, he picked up some pretty unattractive linen uh, and, and hiked it right back into the White House that few, uh, you know, I've, I've often thought neither Bush nor Cheney uh, could, might be able to really survive a full field background investigation that's necessary for federal employment. It's interesting that neither <laughs> the president nor vice president need that. Right, right. So <laughs> everybody, that, everybody that works for them has got to have it, but they don't have to have it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess, you know, the, well, you probably know the running joke of when uh, when uh, Dick Cheney was in charge of the vice presidential selection process and they were vetting everybody. And then Bush uh, comes to Cheney and says, who did you pick? Well, I think I picked me. Uh, and uh, he, he, he couldn't find anybody more qualified. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, you know what's also interesting, and, and part of the, one of the early signs of the secrecy uh, was during the 2000 campaign. After Cheney did select himself to be vice president, uh, heading up uh, the recruitment committee, mm. uh, it, it was well known that Cheney had a very serious uh, uh, medical condition: his heart. Yeah, uh, they had several heart attacks. And that uh, uh, the campaign, the Bush campaign, kept promising they would put out more information on his health and his status, and they never did. They stonewalled it. This this has gone on to this day, where we really don't know what Cheney's health is all about. We do know that he had, was hospitalized uh, during the Florida recount uh, during t- in 2000. Uh, we do know that he has had a stent put in. We know he's he made a couple visits back, uh, but but uh, as I say. Normal medical information uh, about his cholesterol count and all that sort of thing, the, the, the good cholesterol and the bad cholesterol and his heart, his blood pressure and so on and so forth, which other candidates put out routinely, he doesn't put out. Yeah, you, you go into that extensively in your book, which is quite frightening, uh, the, the, the lengths of, of secrecy he has gone to to, to, to uh, protect any sort of information about his health, which is quite important because he's the number two person in, in the White House and in case Bush does uh, something happens to Bush uh, Cheney will be in, involved and uh, considering the stress of what's happening right now um, his health could be endangered well I, I raise that too in the context of the world we live in today of terrorism and having once had the Secret Service under my office as, as the White House counsel I can tell you that it, it, it's very difficult to guarantee protection of presidents and vice presidents, uh, even before the age of terrorism. Mm. Uh, there is some smoke and mirrors involved in all that. Uh, and while we always hope that the Secret Service is, is doing the best they can, they, they recognize it's an impossibility. So what the troubles me is we could end up with no president and vice president, and we've never amended the succession laws uh, to deal with, with terrorism. And uh, I'm just not ready for Denny Hastert to be the president of the United States and the mm. Speaker of the House is the next in line. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I don't think Denny Hastert's ready to be <laughs> <laughs> president <laughs> either. That's right. Uh, 
John Dean, by the way, we're on WBAI 99.5 FM. We're talking with former White House counsel to Richard, President Richard Nixon, John W. Dean. We're talking about uh, the current uh, Washington situation and his book, Worst in Watergate. In your book, you talk about the uh, surprising Nixon-like traits of Bush, um, the, the similarities between Bush and Nixon. Mm -hmm. uh, you were up close with Nixon. What are these traits, what are these uh, the, the similar traits that uh, Mr. Bush has? Well, you know, I, when when Bush ambled onto the scene, nobody saw anything that looked particularly Nixonian. I certainly didn't. They said they're very different types of personalities. Uh, yet, when I started looking a little closer at the two, I found that there are some there are more similarities than there are differences. Uh, they're both men who are highly conscious of projecting an image of themselves. In, in the political arena that is, is different than the true man. Uh, Nixon always portrayed himself as sort of the, the, the brilliant uh, uh, world leader who knew uh, the world uh, intimately, uh, uh, but yet Nixon was not nearly as, uh, didn't have anywhere near the raw wattage that, say, uh, uh, his chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, who was a was truly a genius, a, a Mensa, mm. uh, or Henry Kissinger, who uh, uh, was certainly a, a much more uh, widely read and, and uh, scholarly person than Nixon. But yet Nixon, uh, people didn't realize he 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 was he had made himself smart by grinding. He was a grinder as a student. He was a grinder as a congressman. He was a grinder as a senator. He was a grinder as a vice president, and he was a grinder as president. He took home stacks of work. Obviously, uh, George Bush he portrays himself as sort of uh, the uh, CEO of America Incorporated uh, and running the corporation the, the way uh, he, he wants to, you know, to de delegate his powers. Uh, I don't think Bush is stupid, but I do think he's ignorant, and he's ignorant by design. He's really uh, set up himself a partnership with Cheney where he's delegated to Cheney the the day to day operate much of the day to day operations of Cheney. Cheney's genius is that he lets Bush wake up every morning and think he actually is president. Uh when Cheney is uh, Bush is very good at the at the head of state side of the presidency, uh and the pomp of the presidency and, and he like Nixon enjoy it. But let me scratch a little deeper for you even yet uh, on on these two men. Sure. Uh, when I looked at them closely I realized both men don't really seem to feel that they fill the office of the presidency, say like a Reagan or a Bill Clinton. Uh, you almost had to, we almost had to pull Clinton out of the White House when his <laughs> term was over. Sure. And Reagan certainly filled that, that, that office. But so uh, when I looked, looked at this, I said, what, what's going on here? Why do these men uh, constantly try to escape the, 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 uh, the presidency and the office? Why do they try to get out of town as much as they can? Nixon, who would go down to uh, Florida to uh, uh, to Key Biscayne, where he had a home, where he out to San Clemente, where he had his so-called Western White House, where he'd be up at Camp David, and uh, George Bush wants to spend as much time in Crawford as he can, or he's up at Camp David, or he's spent most of his first term off uh, campaigning and traveling. Yes, uh, they they want to get out of there, and I said, what's going on here? And it, it, when I looked at it, I realized both men have come to know the presidency, and they do know it from a very unique uh, standpoint that they studied it at the at the feet of somebody they really respected as president nixon who studied it at eisenhower as eisenhower's vice president uh... and uh... george bush studied it at his father's feet uh... man he respects like nixon did eisenhower and it seems to me that neither man really thinks that they can fill the shoes of the person they learned about the presidency from and I, I see this also in the way they talk about the presidency. They talk about the presidency in the third person, which is very unusual. Uh, they talk about the president uh, as, as if he's somebody other than themselves, talking about the president does this and the president does that. This is, of course, uh, replete in Nixon's tapes. It's also president in his press conferences. We find it with, with Bush uh, in his conversations uh, uh, private conversations with people like Woodward. It comes up in Woodward's first book, Bush at War. We, then I started to notice it also in his press conferences. So it's a, they sort of have distanced themselves intellectually and emotionally from the office, which maybe lets them uh, uh, do some of the crazy things they do and some of the things that uh, uh, I would think any normal person would have to wrestle with when you uh, 
for example, send people into harm's way and you yeah. don't have really a good basis for doing it. Yeah, well, let's talk about that for a second. By the way, there's so many good uh, 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 juicy uh, stories in this book and information in this book that uh, I found just most fascinating. You talk a lot about uh, 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 Vice President Cheney's role uh, in his previous life as a head of uh, Halliburton. And of course, before that, when he was in the Congress and his uh, disregard of um, uh, congressional prerogative, prerogatives, even though he was a congressman, right. you, you talk about um, some of the environmental, um, uh, the secret altering of environmental reports, critical companies that have donated to the Republican Party, which was very interesting, on, uh, which is very relevant to this program. You also talk about uh, the, what you describe as one of the most insidious uh, examples of uh, uh, abuse of power, which was the uh, the ex expose of Valerie Wilson as a CIA uh, uh, agent uh, by the Bush administration. Um, speaking about these terrorist threats, uh, which are happening right now, um, right. Tom Ridge uh, the other day, uh, well, last week, uh, issued a report uh, saying that we that we here in New York City and uh, a couple of places in Washington were under terrorist threat. A threat and they raised the terrorists, the threat level. Uh, we, we're virtually under um, um, armed guard around here, here in New York City now. Uh, in, in connection with the secrecy level and the, uh, the disinformation that you describe in your book, what sort of validity do you put in these terrorist threats uh, or I I terrorist alerts, I should say, put out by the Bush administration? Well, there would be much more credibility to those, those warnings if we hadn't seen George Bush uh, exploit and politicize terrorism the way he has. Uh, it was clear in the first weeks after 9-11 uh, that Bush was handling it properly, and, but it didn't take long for the light bulb to go off and the political people and Bush himself realizing this is a golden political opportunity. Ever since, they have used 9-11 to increase the secrecy, to try to govern by fear, uh, they've gone out of their way to keep the terror in terrorism. Uh, by comparison, uh, for example, Rudy Giuliani, uh, who certainly uh, was baptized on 9-11, uh, 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 he's gone out and told people, listen, get on with your life. Uh, the possibility of any one of you being affected by or, or harmed by a terrorist uh, is, is almost statistically uh, infinitesimal. Uh, your dangers are, you have much greater dangers traveling to and from work or around the city in taxis. Uh, you, you know, your, the health situations that confront us all are much, much graver dangers. And, that, and that's a more realistic situation. Not that terrorism isn't dangerous and, and something that has to be dealt with. It's just that we can't become paranoid about it and uh, obsessive about it. So what Bush has done uh, is really he, he has geared us uh, and it's almost as if he's followed the terrorist uh, planning. Uh, I was reading a magazine article that just came out this month, uh, last night, uh, in the New Atlantic, where they, where the Wall Street Journal reporter who actually purchased a, uh, uh, in Afghanistan, he, he purchased a, an old uh, uh, computer because his own computer had broken down and just only to discover that it was it was an Al Qaeda computer. The CIA took it and and used it for a while and got but then returned it to him and so he wrote a column or an article based on it. And you read uh, these internal uh, memos of the of the terrorist uh, from Osama bin Laden to his top uh, uh, planners and and they want America to overreact. That, that this is how terrorism succeeds mm -hmm. by by terror by causing fear and it troubles me that uh, that the bush administration has really used this as a manipulative tool uh, the president is now out campaigning on on and raising it every day uh, so it fit it, had he not politicized it uh, people could then better understand when warnings are real and when it's a cry of wolf Yes. So we've got a real problem, and this is very consistent with their with their secrecy, and, and I deal with this at some length uh, in the book. In fact, I, I wrestled with how to handle uh, uh, that situation, and I, about that time, this is before Tommy Franks had written his book, which has just come out, mm -hmm. uh, and Franks says uh, very candidly when he departed from the head of CENCOM, uh, the, the Central Command, uh, as the leader of top general in the war in Afghanistan and then early stages of Iraq, uh, 
uh, he's asked what's the most dangerous thing people should be thinking about, and he says, without equivocation, is that if if we learn that uh, uh, Al Qaeda or some other terrorist organization has a weapon of mass destruction, he said, I fear for our constitution and this experiment we call democracy. Well, that's pretty scary, uh, and I. I'm sure he has seen updated versions of the kind of plans I saw while I was in the White House uh, for contingencies, and they're pretty pretty frightening. Uh, and uh, as I say, these are the sort of things that should be open and debated rather than sprung on America when it's inevitable we're going to have another terrorist attack. Uh, but I don't think any one person needs to be obsessively worried about it uh, because statistically it just can't happen. To, it's going to happen to an unfortunate few uh, but there's no way to prevent that somebody who's hell bent on causing this kind of destruction when they're willing, to, you know, the most effective bomb in the world is is a human being. I mean, he's he's really truly a smart bomb, uh, and if he's willing to give his life to uh, cause that kind of havoc, there's very little that can be done to prevent it. We it's one thirty one Eastern time here on WBAI ninety nine point five FM in New York. Shelton Walden, your host of Walden's Pond, privileged to be talking with John W. Dean, a former counsel to. Richard Nixon and Chief Whistleblower during the Watergate scandal back in the 1973-1974 uh, time period. We're talking about uh, the current situation in Washington, also in conjunction with his book, which was published in April, Worse Than Watergate, The Secret Presidency of George W. Bush. Um, let me infer something, uh, Mr. Dean, um, that um, I got from your book, that uh, because it's, it's very disturbing uh, treatise that you put out here, is that if... Uh, if George W. Bush, uh, the Bush administration, is reelected, um, there might be some scandals that might uh, emerge during the second term because of the uh, the malfeasance of, uh, if I, I'm hoping I'm doing this correctly, from uh, Dick Cheney and some of the uh, abuses that really the Congress has sort of fallen down on on not investigating. Indeed, they have. Uh, Listening to you mention that the book has been out since April, I'm pleased to say that it's still on the, the, the middle of the Los Angeles Times bestseller list. Right. It slipped off the New York list, but it's still uh, it's still in all the bookstores there. Great. So, uh, uh, and it's good because people are are taking have taken this book very seriously. Uh, it wasn't a book that I wrote to bash Bush as much as to raise good government, bad government issues. In fact. What uh, upset a lot of Republicans about the book is that I quote Republicans who were distressed with Bush's secrecy, uh, which is very troublesome. But let me come back to your question about the, the scandals that could indeed erupt. Uh, they could indeed erupt before the election. Uh, but if not, if Bush is reelected, they are for sure going to follow him into the uh, second term. I tracked some 11 scandals. Actually, I had 12 on my drawing board, if you will, mm. when I was putting the book together. The one I didn't put in the book because I couldn't believe it was really going to happen. I was picking up, in, in when I was finishing up the manuscript in, in, uh, in, in February, uh, I, I picked up some, talking to law professors, that there were abuses in prison, in Guantanamo and in Iraq. And I said, oh, no, I can't believe that... Rumsfeld or Cheney would tolerate anything like that. Well, uh, no one was more wrong on that issue. That that's one I should have included because mm. I mm. was had, I had just enough of a whiff of it uh, that I knew that it was being you know uh, swept under the rug at the time. Uh, and then obviously when the pictures came out, it uh, it did erupt into a scandal. And this scandal is still evolving. And that's true of the other eleven scandals that I track in the book. Uh, we've not done a lot of study of scandals. We, we look at the history, we, we have them when they occur, uh, but I was interested in the, the biology or the anatomy of scandal, if you will, mm. and I found a, a sociologist at Cambridge in the United Kingdom who I've subsequently met in New York when I was back there in April, and just by chance he happened to be there, a fellow named John Thompson, uh, who's done some of the best study of the way, sort of the mechanics of how scandal happens, and they happen because uh, in, in the modern scandal, because the news media uh, becomes the integral part. They mediate and, and expand the scandal. Uh, they, they take the position that this is scandalous behavior. In other words, they define the scandal. Sometimes they uncover the scandal. More often than not, they spot it when it's uncovered by others and report it, but they take the position as sort of a, 
uh, it hits a tipping point where across the board people realize, as they have with, for example, the abuses in the in the prison of prisoners in, in Iraq, uh, I think uniformly they've reacted that this is just horrible behavior. Uh, so we've got, I track about, as I say, 11 of these that uh, are coming down, any one of which could erupt uh, at any time or will erupt in uh, the second term if there is one. Uh, uh, let me give you mentioned one in passing, and that's uh, Valerie uh, Valerie Wilson. Valerie, her, her maiden name uh, being Plain, right? Uh, rhyming with Flame, as so <laughs> we always remember it, because it's kind of an unusual name. Sure. Uh, and 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 she was a CIA operative. Uh, it's a tragedy what's happened to her. It's it, it's a loss of a great asset to the government, uh, because the people who do the kind of work that she was doing invest tremendous. They invest a tremendous amount in testing their psychological stability and their intellect and their acumen and things like this across the board. And they, and, they, and they have training after training after training in all kinds of situations. We don't know still a lot about her, other than the fact she's an attractive lady, uh, she has twins and is a good mother, and she also can handle an AK-47. Mm. Uh, we don't know much more than that about her, even though her husband's written a book about this. Mm. But we do know that it was clear that uh, she was re- her, her identity was revealed because it was an effort to discredit her husband for uh, putting the lie to uh, the claim that there were uh, there was a connection between the country of Niger and uh, Iraq, where Niger was supplying uranium yellow cake to uh, Saddam. Mm. Uh, but uh, the, there is a grand jury that is ongoing uh, that must be close to finishing its work. And I say that for several reasons. One, uh, it really got serious in the study of whether it was a criminal of- offense to reveal her identity, which typically there is a statute that deals with that. But there are also other uh, laws that could well come into play other than the statutes specifically designed to deal with uh, revelation of uh, uh, CIA agents. Uh, but uh, the, the grand jury uh, got serious in December when uh, uh, Attorney General Ashcroft recused himself. He kind of kept his foot on the investigation uh, in the early phases. But something happened in December. I think they got a break in the case, and some mid-level person came forward and gave them information, so uh, they had to select a special counsel, uh, which they have done, and, and he is a sitting U.S. attorney in, in, in uh, Chicago, a fellow name of uh, Fitzgerald. Uh, good prosecutor, good reputation, uh, and he's been moving around. He's never moved his operation to Washington. He still operates out of Chicago, his Chicago office, and he uh, is somebody who's moved through Washington, sort of ignoring the protocols of power, if you will, mm and uh, making some waves. Uh, He's interviewed both the president and the vice president. He hasn't called them before the grand jury, but we learned uh, just last week that Colin Powell has been called before the grand jury. Not that I don't think that Powell is a target, but they're just collecting all the information. Uh, And and this is about to erupt uh, at some point, because I I have friends in the media who have been subpoenaed. And I've talked to them about it, and uh, because the story was put out to some six reporters, uh, it would, principally Bob Novak uh, is the one who really broke the leak. Others had the information but didn't report it, uh, so they've all been subpoenaed. Now, uh, under under current law, Supreme Court law, a reporter who's called in front of a grand jury has an obligation to give his sources out to the grand jurors. Uh, and if they don't, they're in contempt of court. So I said to my friend, uh, and one of them, I said, well, uh, I said, I'd be happy to bake some cookies. He said, save it. My wife's baking a cake. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, uh, Mr. Dean, you say in this book that planting this story or leaking this story about Valerie Plame, uh, Plame Wilson is one of the dirtiest tricks I've ever seen in lowball, hardball politics. You said that Nixon never went after his enemies' wives. And he never employed a trick a dirty trick that was literally life-threatening. No, he didn't, and that's exactly, uh, wow. you put your finger right on it. it. It is one of the lowest tricks I've ever seen, uh, and as I say, it's, it, 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 it parallels Watergate in this regard. What, when that, the bungled burglary that gave us the name Watergate, uh, people soon realized was just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, since we're talking on the 30th anniversary of Nixon's uh, resignation, uh, I should tell you that the Watergate cover-up that would result in Nixon resigning was really not a cover-up of the bungled burglary. 
it was of the other stuff that he was worried about coming out because these people, once it started unraveling there, it went back to the White House where they had also conducted uh, illegal operations. That's what was being covered up. Uh, it was it was much more complex than just a bungled burglary. The same, uh, it's quite remarkable uh, that, uh, say, the Valerie Plain matter has been kept under the rug as long as it has, and it's hard to believe there hasn't been some obstruction of justice along the way there, too. Mm. Um, John Dean, we're going to take a brief break. We're going to come back and uh, take some phone calls from our listeners. Uh, right. We're talking with John W. Dean, former counsel to, form, to uh, former President Richard Nixon, 37th President of the United States. Of course, you know him very well. He's in the history books, uh, studied by everyone now. One of the chief whistleblowers in the Watergate scandal in the 1970s, uh, very involved with the Nixon administration. He's written, in, written a book uh, published in April called Worse Than Watergate, the secret presidency of George W. Bush. We'll, we'll be taking your phone calls. You can ask questions of John W. Dean here at 212-209-2900, 212-209-2900. We're going to take a brief break, come back on this 30th anniversary of the resignation of Richard Nixon from the presidency on this day, August 8th, 1974. We'll be right back. My fellow Americans, our long national nightmare is over. Our Constitution works. Our great republic is a government of laws and not of men. Here, the people rule. But there is a higher power. By whatever name, we honor him, who ordains not only righteousness but love, not only justice but mercy. As we bind up the internal wounds of Watergate, more painful and more poisonous than those of foreign wars, let us restore the golden rule to our political process and let brotherly love purge our hearts of suspicion and of hate. Former President Gerald Ford taking, making a speech, his inaugural speech on August 9th, 1974 at the White House after the resignation of Richard Nixon. We'll be right back with more of John W. Dean, former counsel to Richard Nixon, here on WBAI on this edition of Walden's Pond. Stay with us. Back here at 143 on this August 8th, 19, uh, 2004, Shelton Walden here, your host of Walden's Pond. Privileged to be ha to have on the line with us John Dean, former counsel to Richard Nixon, President Richard Nixon, author of Worse Than Watergate, The Secret Presidency of George W. Bush. And uh, we'll be taking your phone calls for him at 212-209-2900. Coming up uh, next here on WBAI is... Ibrahim Gonzalez, and he's back with us uh, with the Sunday show. Good to see him here. He'll be coming up at 2 o'clock here on WBAI. In the meantime, we'll be taking your phone calls for John Dean at 212-209-2900, 212-209-2900. Before we go to the uh, phone calls, uh, Mr. Dean, um, what do you think of the uh, candidacy of uh, John Kerry? Well, I don't know the senator personally. Uh, I've watched him for years. I actually... Uh, found myself back in my files at the National Archives when he emerged <clears throat> as the leading candidate uh, uh, because one of his biographers, a fellow by the name of uh, Doug Brinkley, wrote a book called Tour of Duty, uh, called me and, 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 and quoted me a good bit in the book uh, and said that my files had a good bit of information on Kerry. When Nixon set out to, uh, uh, to try to discredit him back in 1971 when he was active in the anti-war movement. Right. Uh, he really frightened Ken. Uh, uh, Kerry really frightened Nixon, and they set up a guy by the name of John O'Neill, who has now re-emerged uh, 30 years later, uh, and is out with. Apparently, he's got a book that's just about to come out that really trashes uh, uh, Kerry, 
uh, and he's the same guy who was uh, doing dirty work for Nixon uh, 30 years ago. So nothing, <laughs> nothing changes. <laughs> <laughs> was that, song, that song by Carly Simon coming around again. You, know, you got it's, it. <laughs> it's, all, it's all the same. Unbelievable. Well, anyway, the, the, the bottom line is I think that Kerry, I think Kerry's a solid candidate. Yeah. Uh, I think he's a good man. Uh, but I think it's going to be one very dirty campaign. And I say that in the book, too. Yeah, it, it, it is, and it already is. Uh, it's really dirty. It's going to get even dirty. I can't, can't imagine how dirty, much more dirty it can get. But uh, Well, wait till these Vietnam veterans under O'Neill get cooking. They, they are, they're already out there. I was looking at their website, uh, uh, and it, 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 it's lowball they're playing. They're trying to claim that Kerry uh, got his... Uh, his medals and awards by bogus uh, means and just it's just absolutely absurd yeah two one two two zero nine two nine hundred for john w dean former counsel to richard nixon and uh turn off your radio state where you're calling from your name and we're going to go right to it wbai you're on here hello hello this is donald how are you fine go ahead please thank you um you're talking about the outing of that cia agent and mentioning that the reporters might be subpoenaed and required to te- uh, reveal their sources Yes. And then you made the jump to baking a batch of cookies, and I lost you there. Oh, well, the, the, report, the reporter uh, is obviously knows he might be on his way to jail. He's not going to give up his source. Uh, so his wife is going to bake him a cake, oh. which has the blade in it. <laughs> <laughs> that was the leap. Sorry. Oh, that's right. But you wouldn't reveal source even if it was from some government official who was doing it for a bad purpose? Well, that's, you know, as I say in the book, I, you know, I think it's tragic that the press has become complicit in this kind of dirty trick uh, by protecting sources who are absolutely using them uh, to uh, hurt somebody. And why they do that, I don't know. I'm hopeful. In fact, I believe we will learn who did it uh, because I think somebody in the press will realize they don't want to send one of their colleagues to jail uh, unnecessarily. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to seep out there. At least uh, six reporters know it, and probably uh, uh, 60 more when you multiply to whom they've told it. So, it, uh, you know, as I say, I think uh, eventually it may, may creep out, and that would prevent anybody probably from having to be in contempt of court. Okay. Listen, thank you for calling. Uh, thank you for being there, Mr. D. I remember the Watergate very well. As a well, that means, that, that means you're over 45 or you're very precocious as a child. <laughs> Just almost 45. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Know. Uh, two one two two zero nine two nine hundred, and you are on the air. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hi, my name is Sherry, and I just before your show, I watched um, "Like It Is" on Gil Noble with Gil Noble, and he had Greg Palast on. Yes. And they were talking about how one million black votes were not counted, and I just like to know what um, John Dean's view of the uh, lack of voter. Um, protection is. Well, you're talking about the, this could go back to the, um, thank you for calling, this could go back to the secrecy and the obsession with secrecy. Uh. Well, one of the things that obviously was, was on, should have been on any president's uh, agenda was to try to do something. In fact, there were plans to do it, but nothing's been done to, to take care of voting problems, to make sure that we had the proper kind of voting in all federal elections. Uh, Many states have, many states, more states have not. Uh, it's kind of county by county, state by state. Uh, we have the whole issue of electronic voting without a, a record. California, for example, the Secretary of State here shut down voting machines that failed to produce a, a, a paper trail uh, because they're a real problem. One of the things that most people who are concerned about this are doing is they're voting absentee. Uh, absentee voting has become easier over the years. And it certainly leaves a paper trail. Uh, it also banks votes. Uh, so if anybody has any concern, and, and people should because they have not cleaned up voting uh, procedures yet, and that's to vote absentee. It's the best way to keep a, a solid record. Okay. Thank you for your call. Let's move on. WBAI, you're on here with John Dean. Uh, hello, Mr. Dean. It's an honor to talk with you. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that the uh, internal memos from the terrorists themselves uh, – mentioned a lot of the tactics that seem to intermesh with this, this color-coded panic system that they've put in place. Now, the thing I don't understand is, is you know, the, some of the hijackers had very high security clearance and were followed con- constantly throughout uh, their path, and this is one of the big blanks in the uh, 9-11 Commission. This isn't, wasn't explained quite well. I, my theory is, is that the CIA and the Al-Qaeda are of a piece, even though they don't operate always in the same uh, quadrant. Well, you know, I, I, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not a, 
easy conspiracy kind of guy. I've got to have the kind of conspiracy that you can take it into a courtroom and you can show me uh, that there is solid evidence. And, and reading the 9-11 Commission report, which I'm still wading through, but I've gotten through big hunks of it, uh, I sort of started at the back and worked forward. I thought I knew the history, uh, so I started with the recommendations section, which have gotten the most attention, but now I'm reading through this really superb history of what happened. Uh, I, I don't see any parallels. I know too many people on that 9-11 commission personally to believe that there were any punches pulled, that there's any, if there was any evidence of that ilk, that uh, these are men of, of great integrity who would not tolerate uh, uh, letting something like that pass by. And I can't believe we wouldn't know it uh, and uh, have some in- indication of it. So I, I, I really got to reject your underlying assumption. You know, you say in your book that because of the, um, the, the secrecy, that the obsessive secrecy of this administration, that it lends, uh, it gives um, uh, some um, uh, fuel to a lot of these uh, conspiracy theories, like the one, like said that four thousand Israelis were in the right. went home, went, uh, weren't 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 in the World Trade Center, et cetera, and uh, you know all these conspiracy theories that fly around out here. Actually, that's one of the reasons I'm working my way through the report uh, in detail, including all all the voluminous footnotes, because I did raise. A lot of the conspiracy theories that had come up before the 9-11 Commission uh, even commenced its work. And I said that their report will be incomplete if they don't really, in essence, address or knock down virtually every one of these. Now, one of the ways to knock that down is well-documented presentation of what did happen, uh, which would preclude uh, some of the questions that did come up. I haven't completed that process yet, uh, but I'm inclined to believe that they have responded to all those. They were well aware of of the, the conspiracy theories, and I think they've done it uh, rather than, say, you know, directly answer a question, they've put out what is the evidence that they can show solidly. Uh, you've got to remember also that this commission hopes to put out additional information and reports. Uh, they are about to wind up their affairs. Uh, their statutory life is about to end but there well may be some additional publication of more materials, too. Let's move on quickly with a couple more calls before we move out of here. WBAI, you're... Okay, we're talking with John Dean, and you're on the air. Hello? Hello? Hi. Hi, who's this? Well, my name is Ron. Go ahead, please, quickly. Uh, Mr. Dean, uh, it's a pleasure hearing you. I didn't catch it all, but I'm sure uh, I will at some point. Just a few uh, thoughts, and I'd like to get your response. Quickly, one question, please. Okay. Given the way things are going politically with this Republican administration, which is almost a copycat of the other Republican administrations, what would you think the country would look like 35, 40 years from now? Well, if, you know, that's why this is such a decisive election. Uh, it really is. We are at a crossroad right now. We've got the nation is, is, is highly divided, uh, and we're at a point where... Uh, depending on which which person is elected, is going to influence the direction of the country. So I, to to, to look down the road, 35 years uh, of the kind of uh, right wing stuff that's going on right now is not a pretty picture to me. Uh, and I'm I'm certainly I'm I'm a, I'm a registered independent. I don't uh, I don't vote exclusively either side. I vote on both sides of the aisle. And uh, but what I see down the road on this administration is not pretty. I don't want to write volume two of this book. In other words, <laughs> uh, we only about have a minute left. Uh, I just want to get some closing thoughts uh, uh, about all of this. Um, what do you foresee for the country? Do you think that uh, there will be a change in administrations this fall? Well, I wish I had the answer to that. It's pretty close. To, it's, it, you know, it, it, it's. Uh, uh, right now, it, what typically happens when you have an incumbent seeking re-election is the first. Oh, many months, probably until October, people are really assessing, do they want George Bush reelected? Uh, and we know that each, we know the Republicans, the base is solidly behind him. We know that we've never seen the Democrats as unified in their opposition to him. So the decision is really coming down to those independents in the middle. Uh, and those are the people that I, I'm hoping to talk to with this book, mm. uh, people who have some doubts and, and uh, uh, people who uh, need to have some guidance on, on where this thing could unravel. 
so I, as I say, it, it's going to be close, uh, and hopefully the voting is not corrupted so that it is a fair test. Otherwise, I think it'll only add to more divisiveness in the country, and, and we need to get out of this cycle of, of uh, incivility and, and divisive politics. Well, it goes without saying, uh, it, it really is a privilege to be speaking with you uh, today, on, particularly on this day, on 30 years after the resignation of President Nixon. And I wish you success with your book and your attempts to spread information about uh, decency and proper ethics in government. Well, I hope we haven't put too many ripples in the pond today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, maybe we should. That would be a good thing. Yeah, it's always a good thing, actually, isn't it? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And you certainly start, uh, caused a few in your uh, tenure many years ago. <laughs> okay, Shelton, I enjoyed it. Absolutely, me too. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. Take care. Bye. John W. Dean, former counsel to former President Richard Nixon. Uh, was a central figure of the Watergate scandal 30 years ago, uh, and it's been a privilege talking with him. I pick up his book, Worse Than Watergate, The Secret Presidency of George W. Bush. The publisher is Little Brown. Pick it up. It's must-reading, and it's a good read, and it's, a, it's an easy read, quick read, uh, but an important read in this election cycle of 2004. John W. Dean, my guest here on this edition of Walden's Pond, on this August 8th, 2004, 30 years after Richard Nixon's resignation. And that concludes Walden's Pond for this uh, August 8th, 2004. I'm Shelton Walden, your host and producer of Walden's Pond. We're here every Sunday, 1 to 2 p.m. here on WBAI. We discuss politics, health, environment, and a lot more. We'll be back, Spirits Willing, next Sunday, August 15th, 2004, with, with another edition of Walden's Pond. For more information about us, call us at 212-209-2984, 212-209-2984. And or email us at swalden at wbai.org. Swalden at wbai.org. Stay tuned next for Abraham Gonzalez and his program, The Sunday Show. He is here this Sunday here on WBAI. Have a pleasant week and a safe one. Take care.